politicals out there in the two-bosphere, welcome to the Tai Chi, where the center left meets the center right. What do I mean by that? When you strip away the positive and the negative, or the negative and the positive, you are left with common centricity. Common sense, center, centricity, you get what I'm saying. Alright, so, until I can find a flesh and blood Republican around here, who's right of center, because I'm somewhat right of center, but a little more left of center, but I'm still a centrist. Our co-host is going to be an over 100-year-old from the Meiji Restoration period. It was depicted quite well in The Last Samurai, of which some of you may have heard of. Ken Watanabe playing Katsumoto was a real figure. The clash, the final clash between the last vestiges of the Danyo period in Japan, the samurai, and Emperor Meiji, who realized that we got to get up to speed with the European powers. The beginning of which, as you may recall, may have been depicted in Shogun quite well when Richard Chamberlain was the man on point. So this statue being a music box doll, I like to think of more as a representation of that period, which it's from. We're always going to start off with a little bit of a humorous clip. I'm not, I'm not ever going to know which show from MSNBC this is going to come up from, except to say this show is copyright to the Paula Tai Chi. With brief video highlights courtesy to MSNBC or NBC News. The o the OMSR. Yeah, we're doing this show from the same stage of the OMSR, which you may have never seen. That's not important. The Pala Tai Chi does not own these video highlights, but does own all of the other original content and the overall concept herein, thereof, therefore, Dao Dei Jing most strikes reserved. Alright, humorous clip, one, roll. think you can win Ohio. <laughs> Look, now might not be the best time, but uh, could I borrow three hundred million dollars? Is that possible? <laughs> I'm okay! <laughs> Carl Rove got the Saturday Night Live treatment this weekend, and last night The Simpsons weighed in, mocking Rove's Ohio meltdown, with Bart writing on the famous opening chalkboard, I will not concede the election till Carl Rove gives me permission. Look, this was not a good year for the Republican mastermind who inadvertently proved that money alone does not win elections. This is a review of the reviews, as it were. I've been watching politics for 10 years. This is my manifestation of trying to make real the idea of blogosphere.com back in 2004. Yeah, that was me. <clears throat> Didn't do anything with it. Went and joined the law firm. All right, and you may notice that a lot of the reviews, well, it seems to be quite oriented towards MSNBC. Well, there's a reason for that. Why don't we get to keep alive the Keith Olbermann tradition of paperwork in your camera face? But seriously, more importantly, MSNBC is the only cable news network that I know of and have seen. And I used to watch Fox News quite a bit uh, years ago when uh, blogosphere was was in my mind and I wrote many a treatise on the current issues going on back then but they are the only network MSNBC again whom has or that has Republicans on point Scarborough country until the Imus debacle now he's on in the morning and that's like you know three to six in the morning here Pacific time so I don't get to see him as much but uh, you got SA per se <coughs> a bit of a curve, uh, per se on the cycle, and they have plenty of a Republican guests on there. They even used to have Laura Ingram and Ann Coulter on there. This is MSNBC. That's why we cover them. All right. So uh, they have so they're on every day. They have such great material. My intent is to try to bring these things to you, these things to you, in case you missed them for posterity's sake. And so you may be asking, well, the Tai Chi. Well, you're not demonstrating martial arts. No, the Tai Chi martial art came long after the Tai Chi the symbol of the yin and yang, the origin of yin and yang is right here, the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu. I wholeheartedly heartedly recommend it as reading for anybody of any faith because it's the only book that's given me peace. And it's not so much a religious or organized religion kind of a book, it's more of a spiritual philosophical guideline as to how to get along with everyone and everything in 
the universe. All right, so I've set it up. So at the end of each show, uh, I'm going to try to read a, 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 a bit of wisdom from the Tao Te Ching and also quote something from myself that represents the right of center since she can't talk because a lot of times MSNBC does represent the left of left of center or just the slightly left of center viewpoint. The only Republican talking points you might get is vis-a-vis -vis the guests. So I'm going to prove that I'm a little bit right of center and present things to you such as it may come up. The FBI concluded after the final interview given by Paula Broadwell that there was no basis for criminal charges. Officials tell NBC News that National Intelligence Director James Clapper was told about the investigation the following week on Election Day. Clapper informed the White House the next day. Officials say it was not until Thursday, November 8th, however, that President Obama was first notified and met with Petraeus, who then offered to resign. The president accepted that resignation on Friday, the same day that leaders of the House and Senate Intelligence Committees first learned of the entire affair. California Senator Dianne Feinstein chairs the Select Committee on Intelligence, and she joins me now. Senator, why did you and your colleague on the House side, Mike Rogers, Congressman Rogers, not know about this for all of these months? Because a decision was made somewhere not to brief us. Uh, which is atypical. Uh, generally, in what we call the four corners, the chair and um, rankings of both committees, are briefed on operationally sensitive matters. This is certainly an operational sens operationally sensitive matter, but uh, we weren't briefed. I don't know who made that decision, uh, and I think you know that makes it much more difficult. I think it has to be said too that we have never violated that requirement by releasing any information on matters on which we are briefed. So there was no backstory as to why we wouldn't be. Um, so it is very puzzling and I think was a mistake because this thing just came so fast and so hard. And since then, it's been like peeling an onion. Every day, some, another peel comes off and you see a whole new dimension to this. So my concern has actually escalated over the last few days and um, we're putting in place a process, uh, meeting with the committee, uh, spelling out that process and beginning uh, this the, in two days, three days. And the CIA director. Well, not and only you were that, never informed. but an FBI agent apparently took it upon himself to go to members of the House and tell them. And this was outside of the general line uh, of information. And that's deeply disturbing. Was then taken off the case because of supposedly inappropriate behavior. He then was concerned at some point that the investigation was not proceeding. He was perhaps thinking there was a cover-up, and he went to the House members. So it was actually Eric Cantor, the majority leader, who was told about this at least 10 days before the President of the United States. Well, how does that happen? And before you? Well, that shouldn't happen, and we need to get the bottom up to a uh, bottom of it. If it is as you describe, then I think disciplinary action is in order. But I can't prejudge it, and you know I have great respect for you, uh, but we have to find this out as fact, and, and things will go on. And finally, you've said that you should have been told earlier. Should the president have been told earlier? Oh yes, absolutely, absolutely. You know, you cannot keep these things from the people who hold the responsibility for oversight. You have to know, what if something else happened and this never came to light and then down the path something resulted from it? Thank you so very much. You're very welcome. Thank Senator you. Diane Feinstein. And we'll be right back. Election day is over, but not the Republican blame game. So what are the lessons for conservatives in the movement? And joining me now, David Frum, contributing editor at Newsweek and the Daily Beast, and author of the Newsweek e-book, Why Romney Lost, and what the GOP can do about it. So is it all lessons learned, and now we're going to compromise, and we're going to expand, and reach out to Hispanics and women, and not talk about rape, and done deal? You know, the social issues are actually not the primary problem. The primary problem is an what? economic message that does not resonate with the middle class. Now, back in the 1980s, um, the tax burden oh, on ordinary dear. middle class people, it oh, because of inflation, it doubled in the 1970s. So in 1980, if you said, what I'm going to do for middle class people is cut their taxes, that message had power. Today, 80% of Americans pay more in payroll tax than in income tax. As 
Um, and the tax cut as the whole of the economic message doesn't resonate in a world of stagnant wages, rising health care costs, rising college tuition costs. If you don't have answers on that, you're not talking to America. No. But the, what, what, here's what I worry about. I worry that there are a lot of upper class Republicans who are willing to say, if we combine our existing economic message with a new line on immigration, we're done. It's all good. The point is, why should Mexican Americans vote Republican? Mexican Americans as a group are poorer than normal. Uh, and immigration is a threshold issue, and certainly, obviously, you shouldn't insult people, and you should refrain from treating them with disrespect. But after, after they say, okay, you're no longer insulting me, now make your case. What's your... Uh,